सो वी हैव डॉक्टर अभिजीत भारती रेजिंग देयर हैंड शुड वी अलाउ देम टू टॉक या दे कैन लेट्स टेल मी अप या डॉक्टर अभिजीत यू कैन अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ एंड इन केस इफ यू वांट टू से समथिंग I think they accidentally made a move. Yeah. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Good, good evening. evening. Okay, myself, Dr. Abhijit Sparuti. I work in a Trivandrum. Trivandrum. Yes, sir. Because yeah. I'm at present, I am working at the research for in holistic medicine and all. Oh, great. Yep, uh, and um, I'm doing the research associate of a uh, Maharishi Foundation. Oh, They're great. doing the research and work. because my friend accidentally sent this uh, link to me and uh, this is the first time i'm at this program oh welcome welcome <laughs> okay thank you sir i think i wanted to know about more about this program and all i think sure, if you right. have time can i go to okay sir. okay sir welcome welcome to the program. okay thank you so i think uh, mansi ji then uh, i think uh, enough people have joined we'll start the yeah sure i will just give you the polling rights yeah can you see the polls oh uh, yeah i think you can uh, mute people can uh, uh ask their queries or something if they something comes up they can uh, they can ask in the q and a yeah that would be fine okay uh, let's begin so welcome everyone to this ninth module of the fine neurophilia series at the outset i would like to thank the fine team especially dr sudeep kothari sir, uh, sir and uh, uh, mansi ji for helping me out and giving me this opportunity to present to you and talk to you uh, regarding the neurology and making neurology easier and uh, uh, palatable to all of you especially the md and the PD, uh, pediatric students who are aspiring to be neurologists so first of all i'll tell I'll tell you that this is not an entire uh, capsule of what you will like to learn this is to evoke interest in you to learn uh, your textbooks that is basically harrison and bradley and about the muscle diseases the problem is it's a vast topic and it has grown into a super super specialty that is neuromuscular disorders it has got its own uh, post doctoral fellowship and it is a very large topic it is very difficult to cover in even uh, uh, four five classes so what i'll do is i'll try to simplify it and the problem with this topic is that it, these are actually decider questions which comes in muscle diseases as md and pediat md students and pediatricians are completing md uh, medicine and pediatrics you may have come across the diseases but you must have quickly turned the cases to neurologist and must have had less of discussion or the treatment part uh, into your a uh, discussion or your treatment curriculum so the problem is that the questions are made or put by the neurologist and hence uh, and we as neurologists come across these diseases more and hence these diseases or the question from these kind of diseases and uh, the changing scenario in these diseases regularly come as repeat questions or uh, uh, the changing trends in these diseases are regular visitors in the questions especially in the neat and also advancements are there in the institute exam especially aims nim hands pg chitra etc so these questions you may think that uh, won't be that important or necessary but uh, uh, you may think uh, the stroke uh, apart from stroke this multiple sclerosis seizure uh, dementia etc this should be your importance because these are the decider questions so knowing this would be important but once you take harrison and try to read you may find it bit boring because you are not acquainted with this kind of diseases so this module is basically made to make you uh, make you read harrison and make it easy for you to read uh, easier for you to read harrison so let's begin from about muscle disorders so muscles are uh, is basic histology is like epiphysium perimysium and and the endomycin so let's start from where we stop in the neuromuscular junction so as you know for a muscle to move the impulses from should come from the brain and once it reaches the anterior horn sense the lower motor neuron starts 
and from there the it reaches the neuromuscular junction and to the muscle so from there the impulse reaches the muscle and then through the action potential it is propagated to the muscle fiber you can uh, see the uh, muscle fiber here and how it is stim uh, stimulated is actually the next thing we have to see so if you see this this is the basic uh, pathology what happens in the muscle fiber so these n number of questions can come in the mcqs regarding these uh, these kind of uh, pathology so what you see in the red end here is actually the myosin so this this is the myosin the thick filaments and this is the thin filaments which are the active so contraction of this causes the contraction of the muscles so the two z lines are contracting the shortening of the z lines causes the muscle contraction so what happens is as you had seen earlier due to the uh, synapse the neuromuscular junction synapse the acetylcholine passes in the calcium is released so the excess of calcium binds to the troponin you can see here the troponin is there the excess of calcium binds to the troponin and causes the tropomyosin to have a conformational change which opens up the actin filament the actin which oh, the myosin head here has got actually a binding site over the here so when there there is binding of calcium that site becomes uh, free and the myosin because of the atp hydrolysis the head binds to the actin and then it is actually pulled down or a conformational change of course or the contraction of this and hence the z lines gets contracted or shortens to cause a muscle contraction these are the basic things basic physiology of a muscle contraction just to make sure the, the to get uh, you uh, acquainted with the physiology of the muscle contraction so let's try to answer the first question regarding the muscle disease so first question uh, are you able to see the whole session if yes try to answer if, even if you don't know please try to answer so in case of muscles actually there are two types of fibers within your muscles there are type 1 fibers type, different type of fibers that is type 1 and type 2 fibers the type 1 fibers are the slow fibers and the type 2 are the fast fibers and the type 1 fibers are present basically over your axial muscles or the slow fibers or axial muscles which need prolonged kind of action so if you stand for some time uh, for you need to stand or sit direct for a entire day so you need a slow fibers for that action but if you need to run for a long or swim for a long uh, for some time you need the action of a type 2 fibers that is for a rapid surge of energy or a movement you need the type 2 fibers so the question is which is an incorrect statement type 1 fibers are slow twitch fibers type 2 fibers have high glycogen content glycogen helps in fast release that is anaerobic only anaerobic uh, metabolism is needed in case of if glycogen is more type 1 fibers have low capillary supply type 2 fibers are easily fatigued so what do you think is the answer so most of them have answered it correctly that is type 1 fibers have low capillary supply that is actually the wrong statement here type 1 fibers actually need a high capillary supply because they are slow fibers and needs to have a prolonged time without getting fatigue so they need a long uh, uh, fatigue free period and they need to uh, sustain the contraction for a longer time and they need a continuous blood supply and uh, there the metabolism is maintained by basically fats so these are the two types of fibers what is the importance of the knowing these two types of fibers is that when there is a disease to the muscle there is preferential involvement of these two fibers either one or the other so when the disease occurs there will be either one or the other uh, getting more affected and while investigating we look at look at which one got involved to come to a diagnosis that is the importance of this uh, question so uh, most of them have answered it correctly that is uh, which of the uh, which one of the following statement is incorrect that is capillary type 1 fibers have got a high capillary blood supply and they are definitely slow twitch fibers 
So what is this? Type one fibers are slow fibers. They go move slowly. Uh, that is, uh, they have high capillary supply. And type two fibers are fast, and they just uh, after the fast surge of action, they just suddenly stop or get easily fatigued. So these are the differences. They have slow fibers. The one uh, high glide. There I have type one has got. Uh, uh low glycogen capacity or uh, glycolytic capacity uh so i think uh, i made a mistake uh, no type 2 has high glycogen capacity uh, yeah glycolytic capacity is more in type 2 fibers nothing wrong capillary supply is high in case of uh, this slow fiber slow fiber so these are the difference so you need to uh, learn everything about this uh, differences between slow and fast Except that you should know that slow fibers are uh, needed for long, prolonged action. That is why in marathoners, marathoners, those who run for about 42 kilometers, they need more of slow fibers. That is type one fibers. But the fast sprinters or people like uh, uh, this uh, Kipchoge needs uh, type one fibers, and people like Usain Bolt and Ronaldo who sprints to run for for a goal needs type 2 fibers and type 2 much faster is the type 2b fibers so this is the thing and as you know slow twitch fibers because they have high blood supply and their major storage fluid is triglyceride they are red in color and the uh, this the uh, fast fibers are actually white in color so in humans actually these are mixture mixed mixed together and they are in uh, admix, uh, mixed together but in some species like birds and all, they are separated because they actually, if birds, uh, the wings and all, they need actually fast twitch fibers. So if you see the muscle fibers from the wings and all, you may find more of white fibers. So that is why the meat from the white, uh, that, that part would be white. That is why we have the red meat and the white meat. So the red meat will be more of capillary supply and more of triglyceride. So that is regarding them. So every neurologist or aspiring neurologist should know regarding this person just to get inspired. I, I, I am adding a bit of motivation in between because this is a person who, while talking regarding athletes, this is actually Dr. Roger Bannister. He was the first one who broke the four minute mile. That is, he completed one mile in four minutes. The problem is, uh, the, the thing I am telling is that he had to compete, means he had failed multiple times to achieve this success. And uh, I'm telling you this because you must have tried, some people must have tried multiple times, failed, uh, or didn't get your uh, college of your choice, or maybe trying again and again, or repeating for the entrance, that's right. So his success was so important, that is why his uh, autobiography is very famous. His uh, story has been made into a book. So next question is regarding, now we'll see how to approach a case of muscle disease. So uh, try to answer, you must have come across um, many cases in your ward. So this is regarding a patient who had developed in serious onset, chronically progressive bilateral food drop. So you are in an OPD, the patient came with history of bilateral food drop. So that is a very chronic history and he has symmetric weakness without any sensory symptoms. And you examined the patient and you found that the patient had a food drop, but uh, no other uh, severe symptoms. And uh, on reflex examination, you found that all his reflexes were completely absent. And uh, his family, when you asked about his family history, you found that he was having uh, multiple generations of family getting affected. So what do you uh, think would be your localization? So just uh, be open-minded in answering. Just because the, uh, this module is re regarding muscle disease, don't think that this is definitely will be a muscle case or uh, the localization would be muscle. Have an open mind in answering. We'll just try to uh, come to a conclusion after this. So most of them have answered is that peripheral nerve. Second uh, most answer is actually muscle followed by anterior muscle. You are all correct in your own aspects, like uh, your own perspective. You must be correct because complete history has not been given, but we'll try to roll out. 
so don't uh, skip the part where you uh, skip this uh, process of localization so always differentiate see whether the patient is having a problem whether there is actually a problem if at all there is umn whether it's umn or lmn so if it is lmn whether it is a anterior horn peripheral nerve or muscle the usual thing you have to follow in this case the patient is having a bilateral symmetrical distal lower limb weakness that is true and there is absent reflexes all over the body so in anterior horn cell the dictum is that common things are common so what will you see is anterior horn cell usually what we find is actually there is wasting prominent that is wasting is more than weakness and it will be usually proximal weakness and uh, uh, in case of most anterior horn cell it will be asymmetric weakness and uh, there will be reflexes will be depending on the umn and lmn type and if uh, there are rare cases like in case of a distal uh, sma that is uh, spinomuscular atrophy that is a rare distal variant in which you can have this kind of presentation but only lower limb alone is actually a bit rarer so we'll keep it in the down in the down in our differential of localization so second thing would be a multiple root involvement or root there is no sensory so less likely multiple nerve involvement that is either it is a cadp cadp or a hereditary motor sensory neuropathy we have a definite family history so cadp is less likely absent reflexes with distal involvement of cadp cadp is usually a proximal involvement there also there are rare variants like distal variant dad's variant of cadp you have to keep in mind just know that there is a dad's variant but here there is a different uh, definite family history so that is also lower in your list so hereditary motor sensory neuropathy that also can be a possibility definite family history is there absent reflexes are there but you know that peripheral now usually has a sensory component but you know that hmsn usually you may not find any objective or subjective findings except that now conduction may study only may find uh, we may be able to find out some findings and you look for other signs like first cavus or a peripheral nerve thickening so per, uh, peripheral nerve we will keep a, keep it a bit above then come to the neuromuscular junction neuromuscular junction as you know is actually a proximal weakness rather than a distal weakness uh, there are also rare varieties are there and also eye eye involvement would be there so we will keep it a bit low then comes the muscle muscle usually you know that muscle weakness as a dictum it's mostly actually proximal weakness there also we have got a distal type of muscle weakness so that is distal myopathies which could run in families but you know that here in case only we have got a foot drop that is a dorsiflexion weakness but you found that on examination the patient had a definite absence of all the reflexes reflexes could get lost in case of a muscle disease only in case of advanced stage that is when the reflex arc the final common pathway of a reflex arc that is when the muscle is completely lost or completely uh, atrophied or completely disabled then you may not get a reflex but that shouldn't happen in this patient in other parts of the body that is reflex should have been preserved in other parts of the body so in this patient muscle would come a bit lower down the list so here based on your clinical acumen uh, means or on your localization uh, going by the law i think better option would be a peripheral nerve so don't dilute your uh, order of uh, localization uh, in case of approaching a case of muscle disease so i just put this question to make you uh, understand that while dealing with any case of weakness don't uh, skip the step of localization so for once you have identified that the problem is within the muscle you should know that it could be either in the channel in the structure or in the muscle uh, in the metabolism so channels as you know there are multiple channelopathies which would present as muscle diseases which we will discuss in coming slides and muscle structure is the most commonly discussed ones we know that dystrophinopathies are there limb girdle muscle uh, muscle disorders are there multiple diseases are muscle metabolism also muscle multiple diseases like myocardial disease pompey's disease multiple diseases are so this is a, a, a diagram from harrison almost at the end of the harrison 
you shouldn't uh, actually ignore this diagram. This diagram actually answers most of the difficult questions regarding limb girdle muscular dystrophies and other dystrophies, even disjunct muscular dystrophies, all are getting covered in this single diagram. Just familiarize yourself with this diagram and while studying individual muscle disease, go back every time. You can take a copy of this diagram and keep stick it while reading muscle disease and just try to tick it around the diseases so that every time you see this and study the disease, you get familiarized with the uh, structure of the disease. So this is the muscle disease caused due to muscle structure problem. Second goal after finding out the muscle, whether it is a channel problem, structure problem, or muscle problem, is classifying it based as hereditary problem or an acquired problem. And third goal would be definitely for the benefit of the patient, whether we, it is a treatable disorder or, or not a treatable disorder. So treatable, you know, the latest drug in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, dystrophy that it's a recently asked Nimhans question, multiple times repeated in the two Nimhans, that is vitolarsin. And myotonia congenita, etc. the ben benefit would come if you add mexilitin. And Pompey's disease is, benef uh, is benefited with enzyme replacement therapy. And you know, inflammatory my myopathies will re resolve with steroid therapy. So that is usually the approach we go in case of muscle diseases. These are all there in uh, Harrison, but these are mixed. So that is the thing. So, oh. Next uh, thing would be, next question would be, uh, question number three, the most common negative symptom reported by patient with muscle disease. So the patients would come with both positive and negative symptoms. What do you think will be the most common negative symptom reported by patient with muscle disease? So most common is actually still weakness. You may think it's fatigue, but still it's weakness, which the patient presents with. So any patient coming with muscle disease, you have to ask six questions. So among this one will be actually whether you have a positive or a negative symptom, how it evolved, and whether you have family history, what triggered your problem, whether it was episodic, and with other associated symptoms, and what is the distribution of weakness. So negative symptoms, you know, exercise intolerance, fatigue, atrophy, weakness. So weakness is the most one. And positive, positive is actually cramps, contractures, hypertrophy, myalgia, myoglobinuria, and sickness. So you know that MCQs could come from multiple areas. I couldn't go and uh, give you the entire list, but you should know that some diseases, like cramps are more in some kind of diseases and contractures. For example, contractures are more in Bethlehem's myopathy in MRI refuse disease, etc. Muscle hypertrophy, as you know, DMD. Myalgias are more, myoglobinurias are more in some kind of disease. You have to read in Harrison and try to answer. So there is a chart in Harrison which deals with intermittent weakness. It's difficult to master the chart. So to simplify it for you, I had put this question. If you had read the chart, it will be easy for you. Otherwise, Try to uh, answer this question by uh, even if you haven't read it, just try to answer this question. If you have. Just a quick try, please do that. This is regarding a 24 year old male presented with intermittent proximal weakness. So the weakness is coming via intermittently and proximal. The pro you know, the proximal weakness is a characteristic feature of muscle disease, could be anterior onsel also, but intermittently coming more likely muscle disease. And the patient is also having myoglobinuria. So this patient was tested with forearm exercise testing. And forearm exercise testing is a testing in which the patient is repeatedly asked to use, uh, do exercise with this upper arms. And he is repeatedly checked for his serum lactate and ammonia levels at regular intervals. That is one minute, two minutes, four minutes, six minutes, and 10 minutes, five times the blood levels are checked. Look for the rise in lactate and ammonia. So he was found to have no increase in lactate. So what is your probable diagnosis in this case? So most of them have answered it correctly. About 69% have answered it correctly. Yes, they, definitely it's logical. So lactate is not rising. 
So it suggests that something is problem with the lactate metabolism. Definitely lactate metabolism is concerned with glycogen storage disorder. So definitely this is a problem with glycogen disease. So glycogen storage disease. So this was the table I was talking about. So any patient with intermittent weakness and myoglobin, we, we have to, we just see how it happens. Like as we had seen, if there is no increase in, so I, I give you a scenario. If a soldier is coming and patient is complaining of intermittent weakness, every time he is asked to go to the ba battlefield, he is complaining of proximal weakness with reddish coloration or in, uh, color discoloration of urine. And you do this test and uh, you found out that the lactic acid is not rising. Do, will you suspect a, a lactic acid disease or glycogen storage disease in this patient? No. Just see the ammonia levels also. While doing this exercise, you should have a corresponding increase in ammonia also. So lactic acid is not rising, ammonia is not rising, then you should understand that patient is not putting this effort properly. That means that the metabolite of this action is not coming properly. So this may be actually a malingering. If lactate is not rising and ammonia is rising, means suggest that he is putting effort. So that is why ammonia, that is the metabolite is increasing, but lactate, which is, should have come, is not rising, suggests that it is a glycolytic defect. But if you see that lactate is rising, but ammonia is not rising, which suggests that it is actually a carnitine palmitoyl defect or CPT deficiency. That is actually a lipid storage disorder. And if everything, both are rising, means the patient is actually normal. The other two, you have to go for a genetic test. If both are not rising, definitely it's actually malingering. So that is actually regarding intermittent, intermittent weakness coming with myoglobinuria. If it is not coming with myoglobinuria, then we have to go for what? Actually, uh, we have to go for EKG, that is ECG. Why ECG is because if ECG is abnormal, it suggests that uh, you, should to, you should check for that. It could be either due to, a, uh, so you should check for anderson tavil syndrome, which I'll discuss in the coming slide. If ECG is normal, you check the potassium level and it could be either a hyperkalemic or hypokalemic periodic paralysis or paramyotonage congenitor. And if that weakness is due to, with associated with eye problems, it would be a neuromuscular junction disorders. We have discussed about NMJ disorders in the previous chapter. So this is actually simplified thing regarding this a complicated intermittent weakness uh, chart in case of Harrison's. So this was uh, what I talked about. You take blood from the forearm after exercise at regular intervals. That is one, two, four, and six minutes. Check for the levels of lactate rise and see. And other conditions in myoglobinuria are there. It could also come in. But what we are concerned as in the clinical scenario is actually this kind of glycogenosis and lipid storage disorder. Others also would occur. So keep that in mind, process of mind. So this was what I was talking about. A patient coming with intermittent muscle weakness or myo myopathy with EKG abnormality, that is ECG abnormality, that is rhythm abnormality, which could be either a long QT syndrome or a tachycardia, prominent U waves with associated dysmorphic features. So this is actually a triad of elect, uh, e ECG abnormalities, dysmorphic, dysmorphic features and muscular weakness. This anderson tavil syndrome. We have to go for genetic testing. So uh, that was how, uh, how we dealt with uh, the intermittent weakness. So now let's see with uh, about persistent weakness. So persistent weakness, how would you approach? The first question is, what is the most common pattern of weakness in myopathies or weakness? This is a very pretty straightforward question. At least attempt this question. So you get, get the uh, happiness of... So which all patterns do you know about muscle weakness? The most common pattern is actually the limb girdle pattern or the proximal pattern. 
तो मसल वीकनेस हैज गॉट मल्टीपल पैटर्न ऑफ विच मोस्ट कॉमन इज एक्चुअली लिम गर्डल पैटर्न सो मोस्ट ऑफ द डिसीज वी डिस्कस comes under the limb girdle pattern and the other most patterns are actually second one would be the distal weakness or the distal myopathies third one will be a proximal arm that is proximal arm weakness followed by distal leg that is actually the scapulo peroneal we have scapula here followed by the peroneal weakness peroneal supplies the that is the foot drop foot drop so scapulo peroneal that is proximal weakness difficulty in raising the arms followed by Foot drop, that type of weakness pattern. Then distal arm, that is the inability to hold things strongly with the arm, followed by difficulty in getting up. That is proximal weakness. That is the fourth pattern. And the other is actually affecting the torsus and ophthalmoplegia around the eye muscles. Then so sixth one is actually the extensor weakness. Other patterns are also there, like associated with stiffness, etc. But I think you get not getting confused. At least six patterns you have. proximal distal proximum arm with distal leg distal arm with proximal leg torsus with ophthalmoplegia or without then extensor weakness neck extensor weakness so this so we'll go about with it which among the following is not a distal myopathy so those who have read harrison should be able to answer this question easily so which among the following is actually not a distal myopathy the distal myopathy not only con uh, is concerned with all the congenital ones or the named ones it also con has a lot of other diseases so what do you think is not a distal myopathy so distal myopathy is the importance is that most of the questions would come around from the distal myopathy because uh, these are actually bit rare entities it's not that you don't see in clinical practice yes most of them have uh, more than 3/4 have that is 70 percentage have answered it correctly those who are uh, doing this try to just answer if you get wrong here it's well and good it's not an exam so just uh, try to answer that's why i put the poll so answer most of them have answered it correctly that is it's myotonic dystrophy type 2 which is a rarer type of myotonic dystrophy so myotonia is actually delayed relaxation of the muscle so patients having myotonia with dystrophy of the muscles have two types most common type is actually the one with the hatchet facies that is a uh, with distal weakness and the rarer variety is actually one with the type 2 variety that is with the proximal weakness the other two named ones are the miyoshi and nonaka these are actually the named distal myopathies if you have in by heart and the named distal myopathies it's high time you learn it because they are repeatedly asked for the entrance I get acquainted with the names of the myopathies so first pattern is most common pattern is actually the proximal pattern so now we are dealing with the second pattern that is the distal pattern these are the distal pattern that is wielander markusberry gig ad nonaka miyoshi lang when i also first learned i was unable to remember all these thing so what i do is i usually fall back to mnemonics which this one i, I had made it uh, so others are actually centronuclear uh, myotonic dystrophy i told you this one is actually myotonic dystrophy you know this is actually myotonic dystrophy type 1 type 1 will be distal type 2 will be actually so what mnemonic will be used so my mnemonic is actually well mark mark would know my lane so well mark would know my lane william this is my mnemonic uh, you should make your own uh, i used to make it for learn because uh, if a patient is suspected to have a distal myopathy or something this definite question would be there you should uh, list out some at least two to three distal myopathies and in the entrance of point of view this would be coming in your mcq options so you have to rule out so wielander markusberry gig ad nonaka miyoshi lang and williams these are the distal myopathies so about the myotonic dystrophy you know a patient coming with myotonia the patient will be having difficulty that is distal weakness then solely proximal weakness and uh, the patient will having grip myotonia patient will be able to 
uh, grip onto an object but unable to release the object suddenly so these are the uh, different problems so we in the first question we had seen that there are selective type uh, fibers that is type 1 and type 2 fibers in type 1 fibers uh, type 1 type 1 myotonic dystrophy the more problems occurs in the type 1 fiber and in type 2 dystrophy remember that more problems occurs in the type 2 fibers or the type 1 fibers are more uh, less less affected so that usually occurs in myotonic dystrophy so basic thing type 1 of, uh, occurs in at any age congenital forms are there and it is actually a trinucleotide repeat and uh, type 2 is actually a tetranucleotide repeat and uh, it's a distal one and the predominantly affected fibers in type 1 is type, uh, is definitely type 1 and type 2 is type 2 so since it's a trinucleotide repeat you pre, uh, you actually should have think you should think that the patient may have anticipation you know anticipation right actually and in huntington's disease and all there is anticipation so with coming generations, there is actually high tendency that younger people will have uh, earlier presentation of this disease. This could occur more in case of myotonic dystrophy. So more points regarding myotonic dystrophy you have to learn. So this is one of my patients uh, who had um, you can see that delayed uh, relaxation of uh, this is actually grip myotonia after asking to actually should keep the fingers between her hands then this was actually a case of myotonia congenita myotonia congenita as you know is actually a chloride channel open. so try to answer this question i'll read out for you a 38 year old male a right shop owner came with chief complaints of difficulty in walking of 12 years of duration. That is a long standing history of difficulty in walking. And now he has developed weakness of upper limbs. So he first noticed that he was unable to close the shutter of his right shoe. That is, he was unable to stand on the uh, toes. So uh, this is a representative image. He has to stand on the uh, toes to get hold of the shutter. So he was unable to do so. Later developed difficulty in climbing. That is more proximal weakness. So standing on toes, that is, uh, then he had preserved reflexes in the upper limb, but uh, and plantar was flexor. So I uh, representative image just for you to understand. So uh, if you have now read the distal myopathies, then we, you will be able to answer. So you have read Miyoshi, Nonaka, Williams, Wielanders, Wood, Marcus Berry gig. These are the I am repeating it so that it get registers in registered in your mind regarding the distal myopathies. So this typical pattern is present only in a few myopathies or very rarely in some kind of myopathies. So that's why I put this question. So this is a patient who came to me who was diagnosed genetically as some disease. And what do you think this disease is? This is actually, you know, it started as a distal myopathy, then only it progressed. So most of them have got it correct. So this is actually, a, what we are describing is actually a plantar flexion weakness. So most of the distal myopathies, even though it is a distal, usually has actually difficulty in dorsiflexion rather than plantar flexion. The plantar flexion weakness usually rarely occurs in case of Miyoshi myopathy. So Miyoshi myopathy, you have to keep in mind. So this was the patient's limb. You know that uh, plantar flexion is by the posterior compartment and he had severe atrophy of the posterior compartment as you see here. And uh, this was the uh, examination. Uh, actually, uh, I'm unable to forward. It's a large, it's a lengthy video. So I'll to show you the important part. So he is able to uh, plan, he is able to dorsiflex. You can see, he is able to dorsiflex. You can see dorsiflexion is poor. You can see, right? 
Dorsiflexion is very strong, but plantar flexion you can see it's very weak. It's unable to do that properly. So plantar flexion more weak than dorsiflexion. So it's it's a Miyoshi myopathy. So uh, this is also another patient of mine. Just to show you, so this is actually a usual pattern in case of distal weakness. In which the patient will have come with a food drop presentation. You, I showed you the first, second question where we had localized the patient to HMSN, that is hereditary motor sensory neuropathy. That is localization to peripheral nerve. Just because of the absence of reflexes, we localize to peripheral nerve. But rarely, we should think we should think also of muscle disease when the reflexes are preserved. Here, the patient was walking with a bilateral foot drop. That is. High stepping uh, stepage gait. The patient, uh, one foot we had uh, put actually the foot drop splint. So, this actually is a case of nonaka's myopathy. Nonaka. So, these things, uh, is, these are not just fancy terms. We come across these kinds of cases. We have my, Miyoshi, Nonaka, we land all in our um, clinical practice. So, which, of the, which, which one of the following distal myopathies predominantly affects upper limbs? Which of the following distal myopathies predominantly affects upper limbs? Try to answer the question. So these uh, questions regarding this distal myopathies are a big table in Harrison, which I'm trying to make it easier for you. So table-wise, we are dealing with Harrison. Yes, most of them have answered it correctly. Try to answer. So by now you must have familiarized, got familiarized with the names. Yes, it's actually the Vilanta. Vilanta, which has got a proximal, up, I mean distal upper limb onset. So this was the table I was talking about. This uh, you can just open your Harrison and see. Just mark the important points. So this was regarding Vilanta, which begins in the hands. So which of the among the following is a, this is a bit controversial question. That's why I had put it in. Uh, so if you have read the table, so those who have read the Harrison, those who are repeaters would jump and answer and they are answering it. It's actually Williams. Uh, but the problem is that I also had found it interesting because that is the most likely question you should you would come across because very interesting point that is X-linked distal myopathy likely question. But the problem is while searching uh, that Williams myopathy is X-linked. So distal myopathies are most likely either autosomal dominant or recessive. That is why most distal myopathies are not linked to X chromosome. And uh, we uh, this. Uh, this Williams is actually autosomal dominant according to the OMIM report. So please note again, if you find anything, you can message me regarding uh, your uh, finding or your uh, data. So uh, Harrison has written it as X-link, but uh, other reports say otherwise. So which one of the following muscles is characteristically spared in facio-scapulohumeral dystrophy? So you must have seen cases of facio-scapulohumeral dystrophy. It's not that it's rare. We have, we have must have you must have seen cases. So there is a selective the characteristic pattern of muscle involvement. This muscle diseases are there. They have selective involvement. Even a same muscle will have differential involvement. Same muscle, if it is a large one, some parts will be more involved than the other. So that should ring a bell, and you should think in terms of a muscle involvement. That is a muscle disease. Yes, most of them have answered. This is actually a repeat question. In NEET, as well as institutes, they have got repeated. So, yes, uh, it's actually uh, the answer is deltoid. So, the problem with this is actually uh, we are now talking about the third pattern that is proximal distal. We have covered that is third one is the scapuloperoneal pattern. That is the facio scapulo peroneal dystrophy. So it could come with acid maltase, central core. The central core myopathy is actually a type of congenital myopathy. Congenital myopathy we will discuss in the next module. 
they are mini core multi mini core congenital fiber disproportional type namelin rod these are all so these are the different types of caploperoneal pattern and uh, this will be the different findings in case of a facial scapular femoral dystrophy so we have beaver sign so beaver sign is usually find found in actually a t10 localization right t10 localization there is uh, upgoing of the umbilicus that is what is called a t beaver sign and what is polyhill sign and what there will be facial weakness and asymmetry and wasting of muscles will be there there will be because of the peroneal weakness you will get foot drop that is why we have scapulo peroneal type of weakness about polyhill sign we will discuss now so this was the uh, this is regarding the polyhill sign so polyhill sign there will be actually differential involvement and you can read about polyhill sign and you have spared muscles are usually the upper abdominals so since the upper abdominals are spared that is the reason why we have beaver sign apart from the t10 localization we have beaver sign in case of facial scapulo humeral dystrophy and forearm muscles are spared so if in an mcq you get brachioradialis as an option you better and deltoid is not there you should answer it as brachioradialis brachioradialis is spared and you should know that anterior deltoid is also uh, spared and posterior part is mildly affected it's not that deltoid is totally spared some part of posterior deltoid is affected in case of this uh, fshd and also you should know that rotot rotator cuff muscles are spared so why this patient is having uh, abduction weakness this patient will have some kind of abduction weakness you know that deltoid and rotator cuff will be associated with abduction but this patient both these deltoid and rotator cuff are spared so why should that patient have some abduction weakness this is because of destabilization of this region shoulder region so which among the following is not a sign elicited in facio scapulo humeral dystrophy so this would be an easy question for you because uh, we have discussed most of the things you have to read more about fshd uh, try to answer this discuss regarding beaver sign that is because of selective sparing of the upper abdominals we do we get the beaver sign popeye arm sign is actually because of the weakness of the uh, arms arm muscles and sparing of the forearm muscles we told about the forearm sparing you know the popeye the sailor man cartoon character he has the thick or broad hypertrophied forearms so that is why he has the popeye arm appearance poly hill sign we discussed and what is this shank sign shank sign is a finding you see in case of myotonic dystrophy so what is this shank sign you know shank is this part of the animal or a cattle so shank sign means the sudden tapering of the muscular part and going in like it's like sudden tapering so uh, shank sign so this is like sudden tapered end of the leg of a animal or a cattle so if you go to a restaurant or a, uh, and ask for a shank part then that is actually the shank so you can see here so this is actually seen in case of myotonic dystrophy so other signs are valley sign poly valley sign you know in case of duchenne muscular dystrophy calf head on trophy sign in case of lgmd 2b so the case which i showed you about uh, that plantar flexion weakness that difficulty in standing on two toes was actually a miyoshi myopathy or the way is called lgmd type 2b that was the case and uh, others you know so a patient presented with distal upper limb and proximal lower limb weakness so in third pattern what we discussed was scapulo peroneal most common prototype uh, disease is actually the facio scapulo humeral dystrophy other disease list we had seen fourth pattern is actually a patient presenting with distal upper limb and proximal lower limb weakness which among the following is the most likely diagnosis what do you think will be the most likely diagnosis in this case fshd we have discussed is scapulo peroneal pattern myotonic dystrophy type 1 we have discussed it's actually distal pattern lgmd the name itself says that is actually a limb girdle muscular dystrophy LGMT type 1a is like the otherwise called myotilnopathy and it has additional feature of actually dysphagia 
these all are actually additional points which we have to learn while dealing with lgmd we'll learn it in the next class now right now let's just uh, see the each pattern and each diseases from the each pattern so the answer is actually inclusion body myositis so it's actually an inflammatory myopathy and the pattern is actually distal upper limb followed by proximal lower limb so distal upper limb has a specific pattern that is actually distal forearm muscles that forearm flexors are more affected than comes the uh, proximal muscles so which one of the following myopathies have causes without ophthalmoparesis so uh, don't get confused uh, uh, ptosis without ophthalmoparesis would which would be the best option which will you go, which you will go for ptosis without ophthalmoparesis so there is closing of eyelids but there is no uh, eye movement abnormality uh, so i wrongly wrote the last uh, sorry the option i had drawn bit long wrong no problem no problem let's see so oclof is it om opmd mitochondrial myopathy myotonic dystrophy or hereditary inclusion body myopathy type so this take has been directly taken from the table from harrison the first table where they have classified the muscle patterns so opmd will have both ptosis and ophthalmoparesis you know mitochondrial myopathy like uh, cpeo etc will have the same myotonic dystrophy will have only ptosis no ophthalmoparesis and hereditary inclusion body myopathy type 3 this is totally different from hereditary inclusion body myositis this is just myopathy and not myositis i put this question just because it is there in harrison so this is similar to what we have seen like in nonaka nonaka myopathy just for your information it is not myositis it is myopathy and the answer is actually myotonic dystrophy so pattern is actually without ophthalmoparesis we have myotonic dystrophy with the ophthalmoparesis the others so this is the pattern so questions could come from this pattern so so this is the fifth pattern we were talking so this is the table uh, part from harrison which had took took so this is the hereditary inclusion body myopathy type 3 mitochondrial myopathy oclopharyngeal muscular dystrophy etc will have ophthalmoparesis along with ptosis but while myotonic dystrophy will not have ophthalmoparesis when along with ptosis which among the following is not a cause of drop neck syndrome so because of the extension weakness that is the extensors becoming weak the patient will not be able to keep the head in the extended position or upright position so which of the following is a condition uh in which patient which is a except answer in this try to answer this simple question again uh, do you have answer no the, i have the option i have put it as hyperparathyroidism which is actually a cause hyperparathyroidism is one of the causes for drop neck syndrome so don't jump into answers so actually hypoparathyroidism is not a cause hyperparathyroidism polymyositis uh, and there uh, that is mnd myasthenia gravis etc are causes of drop neck syndrome so these are the conditions in which we get neck extensor weakness hyperparathyroidism myotonic dystrophy etc myopolymyositis that is all the myositis so the pattern it could be autosomal dominant autosomal recessive mitochondrial or extensor so out of out of the these things which do you think is a x linked pattern you usually see in case of muscle disease simple question you must have already know yes straight forward answer so the pattern also you have to while reading individual diseases if there is something odd you keep in your mind that this could be coming as an mcq so you know that dushin becker etc are actually x linked you should also know that emery drefius is not only x linked there is a variety for uh, autosomal dominant variety also in case of emery drefius syndrome dystrophy so uh, opmd is actually 
autosomal dominant type. So X-linked Becker, Duchenne, Emery, Drifius, autosomal dominant most of the diseases, and the autosomal recessive is Becker. This Becker and the Thompson, this Thompson and Becker myotonia are actually myotonia congenita. This autosomal recessive is called Becker myotonia. Autosomal dominant is called Thompson. And LGMD, length girdle muscular type one, is actually autosomal dominant, and type two is autosomal recessive. Which among the following is a calcium channelopathy? So now regarding calcium channel of regarding channelopathies. So this also you have to keep in your mind and by heart regarding channelopathies. Yes, uh, some have confusion in their answers. I told you that Thompsons and Beckers are actually myotonia congenita. PMC is actually paramyotonia congenita. We have hyper and hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Okay, so most of them have answered it correctly as hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So while discussing, we know that there are channelopathies, structure disease, and metabolism. So structure, you see the saw the structure channelopathies. We are going to discuss. So this is the list of channelopathies. So how to remember? It's very difficult. So you. Learned about Thompson, which is autosomal dominant. Becker is autosomal recessive, and uh, so this myotonia congenita is a chloride channelopathy, and sodium channelopathies are paramyotonia congenita and hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, and calcium channelopathy is hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So here also I will use a code. This was taught to me by my mentor. So Mayo Clinic. Myotonic congenita. Myotonia congenita is actually a chloride channel. So I remember as Mayo Clinic, which is a great institution. So it's actually myotonia congenita, chloride channel. And PNH, paramyotonia congenita, sodium channel, hyperkalemic periodic. Calcium channel, these I remember as hypokalemic periodic. There is a definite code. I am separate code for that. So Mayo Clinic, at least remember Mayo Clinic, myotonia congenita, PNH, para Paramyotonia congenita, T and H. I remember like that. So, question number 17. So, channelopathies, multiple n number of questions can come from channelopathies. And you know about, uh, you saw the list of potassium channelopathies in that list. They also come will come as questions. So, this is a different question. Try to answer this question uh, before launching the poll. I think, uh, can you see the question side by side or the poll alone you can see? So read the question before uh, launching the poll. A 13-year-old boy presented with muscle pain and stiffness over the past. He had weakness also. He feels that his eyes feel squeezed shut for a minute after he sneezes. His muscle stiffness is worsened with cold and while he goes for ice keeping. And uh, he has percussion myotonia that when we percuss, he had delayed relaxation. And his problem increases on repeated activity. So prolonged activity causes repeated myotonia. So which is the most likely channelopathy to occur in him? So when he goes, that is repeated sneezing, that is repeated activity causes repeated closure, that is strong closure of his eyes. So what do you think is the channel affected in him? So what do you think it is? Yes. So you talked about myotonia congenita, which is a Chloride channelopathy, uh, then uh, paramyotonia congenita is a sodium channelopathy. So, what do you think? So, this is cold exposure aggravating the disease and repeated activity worsening the disease is actually a problem with paramyotonia congenita. In case of myotonia congenita, what happens is repeated activity actually eases off the syndrome. So, a patient taking a rest will have to repeatedly have an easing of phenomenon. That is, repeated activity will help ease off the effort and will have he can or he or she can move off easily. But in case of paramyotonia congenita, repeated activity will cause increased fatigue, just like in case of myasthenia graves. And cold will definitely aggravate the symptom. So that is the importance of paramyotonia congenita. And we remembered like PNH, paramyotonia congenita, sodium chalinopathy, and hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. And so that is the thing. 
So that is actually paramyotrina congenita, a rare dystrophic syndrome, and this is the thing. So a patient with myositis, you know, inflammatory myopathy, myositis, we treat with steroids. It was a uh, patient after treating with steroids should improve, but we found that the patient was worsening. You know that one of the causes of myopathy is actually drugs, toxins, and steroids. So what do you think, how will you actually go about uh, in this patient? Or how will you make out whether this was due to the worsening of the polymyositis or it would be due to steroid? Both will cause actually proximal weakness to worsen the patient. What do you think? So we are, we have finished the approach of muscle disorders. How you go about seeing a case, which are the patterns of the disease, what are the types, channels affected, structure affected, metabolism we will see in the next class. So it's, this module is to get you acquainted with the diseases, get you uh, uh, different names and all. Next uh, class, we will try to finish it by the time you read about the muscle disease. Yes, most of them have a mixed response. It could be CPK or muscle biopsy. Okay, so the problem is here is actually the patient, first thing to do in such a patient is to actually stop the medication and see. So stopping steroids, if it's due to steroid, the patient will improve. But in such a case, you should understand that steroid uh, induced myopathy, there won't be any increase in CPK. But polymyositis, there will be in serial CPK evaluation, there will be large increase in CPK. So CPK is the first way to identify. And next thing, if you want a definite answer for this, you can go for muscle biopsy. The thing is that EMG won't help you find an answer. Antibody testing also won't help in prognostication. Muscle biopsy, the thing is that in polymyositis, you know that you have a inflammatory cells, increased inflammatory cells, and the uh, finding in the muscle biopsy is that actually type 1 fibers will be more atrophy. In uh, the other one, it, uh, that is steroid myopathy, the muscle fiber atrophy is actually basically type 2. But usually we don't go for myocell biopsy even in case of such a scenario, unless and otherwise your CPK levels are unable to tell you the answer after stopping the drug. So best answer would be CPK. Second best would be muscle. So best First way in a clinical scenario is to check for the CPK levels. Second best or the best would be the muscle biopsy. So in case of muscle diseases, usual investigations, what we do is serum creatine kinase, LDH, other routine tests. Then go for uh, nerve conduction, electrophysiology with nerve conduction and EMG. And uh, uh, genetics in case of uh, inherited disorders, and in case of others, you get go for muscle biopsy. So creatine kinase is typically elevated in case of polymyositis dermatoma, that is inflammatory. And steroid myopathies, it will be elevated. And your, uh, steroid myopathies, it has been, uh, it is actually, uh, usually it is not elevated. Uh, serum creatine is not significantly elevated. That is the thing. Usually we go in, don't go for muscle biopsy for diagnosis, but if you are that doubtful, then usually you go for muscle biopsy. EMG, you usually don't go for, uh, you cannot differentiate between the two. So that question I had put just to make you understand that these are the investigations we go for in case of a muscle disease. So in case of muscle disease, which, which muscle would you biopsy to come to a conclusion or a di diagnosis? Is it grade zero, grade two, grade three, grade four, or grade five? So always keep in mind that you have to select a weak muscle, but you have to make sure that the muscle is not totally weak. So weak muscle, by we, by we mean that the patient should have at least grade four power. Grade three means the patient's muscle would have gone at, um, defective and fibrosis must have set in. And then it is very difficult to come to a conclusion in case of uh, such patients. So ideal answer is actually grade four. So you uh, could get answers in NIMHANS and all, you could get questions from different uh, histology, that is pathology part of muscle biopsy. So just see the slides before the NIMHANS and all, just see this video uh, regarding this, stains used and which are the uh, morphology, what we are looking with different states. 
so rag red fibers you look for the uh, which stain used is actually modified gomore trichom pass glycogen neutral lipid or you have to go for oil red or that is lipid lipid storage diseases etc you go for lipid or amyloid congo red etc and you shall you get a checkered pattern in case of a atps thing and uh, this is actually the checkered pattern we are telling so you we were telling in the first question regarding type 1 fibers type 1 fibers are what we see in the light stain here type 2 are the dark stain so this is actually a atps stain which we see in actually a ph of alkaline ph but this will reverse if we go in and see it in a acidic ph tough questions would come only in case of instituted sense this is actually a normal checkered pattern you should see the edges actually these are actually like a checkered if edges are getting uh, dampened or rounded and all you should think that this is actually myopic just a question this also biopsy question just uh, if you can you just try so what do you think i'll give you a clue this if if you see the edges of this fibers it is not as prominent as the in the middle it is due to some problem in the muscle yes actually this is a fascicle and the edges are not as prominent as the and you all so can see inflammatory cells here so this is actually an inflammatory myopathy with some edges getting atrophy so this is actually a dermatomyositis inflammatory with so it is actually a dermatomyositis so the, what we see is actually periphyscular atrophy with inflammation in case of a dermatomyositis oh so so this is another point in which inclusion body myositis we find inclusion body so this is inflammation so these are the differences between polymyositis dermatomyositis and uh, inclusion body myositis so these are inflammatory myositis try to make a difference the so polymyositis predominantly will have more of inflammatory cells dermatomyositis will have a characteristic pattern which is called perifascicular atrophy along with inflammatory cells and inclusion body myositis will have some characteristic inclusion bodies within them and you know the inclusion body myositis the characteristic pattern will be distal upper limb followed by proximal lower limb the other two will have a proximal weakness and dermatomyositis you know all the different external findings of dermatomyositis that is uh, gotrens papule scholzen etc etc in case of so you discuss regarding biopsy uh, creatinine kinase types of fibers etc now we will go and see one emg finding in this uh, case of a muscle disease so uh, first before launching the poll can you hear it this is to develop an inquisitiveness uh, regarding uh, different muscle bio muscles and the various electrophysiology regarding the muscles can you hear it i hope you can okay so what do you hear in this straight forward if you have try to answer so it's like a rubbing pattern waxing and waning type of pattern fasciculation would just beat in like tuck tuck it will go and just like a nicking movement at least myoctymia is actually a grouped beating so it is actually a neuro myo it is actually a myotonia which we have seen which you have seen so just see this uh, if you, uh, it's actually a choppy video i think but you can see what i was showing you was actually a dive bomber sign what is dive bomber is actually uh, the planes used in world war 2 what it does is actually uh, it it comes from a great height for its accuracy and great impact it comes down and hits the target with a great force so the sound is like waxing and waning so someone uh, in the ground or above 
what were will what were they will see is that what they hear will that is that something is coming fast like mm, and then go go back so just uh, or you can uh, just uh, see uh, like a motorbike being raised with an accelerator accelerator being raised in a motorbike revving engine sign revving engine sound so otherwise called dive bomber sign this is characteristically seen in myotonia and you know the myotonia conditions like myotonia congenita myotonia and uh, this myotonia myotonic dystrophy and neuromyotonia is a rarer condition you find in case of isaac syndrome that is actually a different condition which is called peripheral nerve hyperexcitability syndrome like isaac syndrome morvan syndrome etc this is actually a myokymia or this is actually neuromyotonic the difference between myotonic discharge waxing and waning myokymic will be just like a marching of a soldier that is couplets and uh, that is grouped beating a neuromyotonic discharge will be different from that so what is the probable diagnosis in this patient so you found out myotonia in the emg so what is the probable diagnosis in this patient just give an attempt is it isaac syndrome no because isaac syndrome is actually a peripheral nerve hyperexcitability syndrome where you get neuromyotonia more than also neuromyotonia brain stem glioma is actually where you get myokymia or in case of a radiation plexopathy you get myokymia which is actually group b so thompson syndrome is other name for autosomal dominant myotonia congenita we were we had discussed regarding that so that is this is the regarding so this is our uh, so i think we have approached our myopathy properly so this was to get you acquainted with all the muscle disorders uh, how to approach read harrison thoroughly you must when reading you now would have come across all the most of the diseases properly at least the names so next week we'll deal with most of the diseases the specific signs the advanced questions and uh, hope this module have helped you to get uh, read harrison more and get got uh, helped you get an impetus of reading harrison so thank you for your patient listening and i hope uh, this kind of uh, concising the myopathy pattern to you would have for made like was helpful to you uh, thank you all so thank you manshi ji thank you fine team thank you everyone for listening thank you